2011, and manage their, the development of bioplastics within the company, as well as the use of bio-based feedstock. Right. And she will tell us about the strategy of Per Stop on sustainability issues and the development of compostable plastics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to say, it's a very well-organized event, and it's very nice to be here. So a big thank you for that, and for the introduction, and for the opportunity to give this speech. Yesterday, I was approached uh, by a person that told me, oh, you're, you're from the Nordic countries, uh, where the environmental awareness is quite high. So you can say anything about sustainability and developments in that field, because they will believe you just by being from Sweden. But I still think you, that you would like to have some facts and figures, maybe a graph, or one or two. And so that I will show you. Uh, I will take you through a brief introduction of Perstorp as a company. And then we will talk about the Swedish waste management. And then you might think, why would a company like Perstorp talk about that? But as Virginia said yesterday, materials and waste go hand in hand. So we need to understand where they might end up. I will continue talking about the waste refinery study and how we can use the conclusions from that. And then I will talk briefly about the products that Perstop are contributing with and the future as well. So some brief words about the company. It's a global company. We are in 22 countries, uh, 1,400 employees. Um, we are uh, from having a broad product portfolio, we are now just focusing on the spe specialty chemicals markets. Uh, we have been a pioneer in the formalin chemistry, and now we are also looking more deeply into the polymer industries. Uh, we were formed in 1881, so we've been around for quite some time, and we've been through many changes, and now we're currently owned by uh, PAE, PAI Partners. So what about the waste management in Sweden? Well, these regulations are pretty much aligned with the European Union. And so we try to prevent waste in every possible way. And if that's not possible, it's reuse, recycling, other types of recovery, and in the very end, landfilling. But as you will see, landfilling, there has been a dramatic change in Sweden in terms of that. Uh, since 1994, the mater material recovery has more than doubled and the organic waste treatment has more than quadrupled. And energy recovered recovery has increased by 70%. And at, during this same period, the landfilling has decreased by 98%. So in 2001, we had a, a number of 11%. As of now, we are landfilling less than 1%. And so how are we doing this? What kind of systems do we have in place? Looking at the households as such, we do a lot of separation in our homes. And we go to these facilities or we have houses next to, if you live in an apartment, where you do the sorting. And uh, around 33% uh, is sorted into glass, paper, wooden products, metals, and these things. And then 50% goes to energy recovery and 16% is the organic waste, which we are sorted ourselves. And there has been almost a 6% increase in this organic waste from 2012 to 2013. And, and in Sweden, that waste can either be treated in composting facilities or in anaerobic digestion facilities. And there have been collection of these, and they are done by the municipalities or external actors and we have over 290 municipalities in Sweden and so you can imagine aligning that work and getting it all to yeah to sort it out uh, it uh, it's can be a challenge sometimes and the how we are handling the waste can be a bit different especially when when we look into the anaerobic digestion and that's why we did a waste refinery study as well and these numbers, these increasing figures, it shows that there is an increasing awareness. We want to make a change, and it starts in our homes. And so that also m tells us that what the materials that we are developing will have an impact, and we need to help the households using them in a good way. And then we look into the trends of composting and anaerobic digestions. 
there's actually an increase in the anaerobic digestion by 21%, and the composting is decreasing by 14%. And really, the reason for that is the added value by having the biogas. And then in the end, if the digestate is certified by SPCR 120, which states the metal content and that it's uh, hygienized and so forth, then you can have it as a fertilizer as well. It's quite interesting figures. And so that's the driver. And in certain regions in Sweden, the, the biogas production has really taken off. The bigger cities like Stockholm and Gothenburg, especially in the south of Sweden, where I come from. And so you can see that the two major parts where it's being used is as a fuel or as a heat. And if you look at the trend, it's just increasing. So that is something we need to think of when we use these bioplastic materials. The, sweet, the um, waste refinery study that was performed in 2013, it was really to find uh, an overall solution in terms of having a, a bio bag for food waste. We have, uh, as I mentioned, several different systems where we try to collect the food waste. We have a paper bag in some areas, in other areas, we have a plastic bag, and they have different colors, and they are colored green for the organic food waste. And then they are separated by IR, and so, and then the bag is removed. And then we have the existing bio bag. And uh, the paper bag is not very much appreciated from a user point of view. They are leaking, it's difficult to seal them, they can break when you use them, and they can actually get stuck in the vessels during the winter time when it's freezing, which is quite common in Sweden. The plastic bags, they get stuck in the processing parts normally. But that's not all, 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 always the case. There's some more pedagogic thing to it. You throw your organic waste into a plastic bag where you sh you're not supposed to throw any other plastic things inside and who, how to tell them apart. And well, you could argue the same for the compostable bio bag, but somehow it's more accepted. But it's not biodegrading rapidly enough in these systems. And so how can we approach that? Well, in this study, it was decided to develop a new compostable bioplastic bag. And it has to fulfill several criteria from a user friendliness, but also from a performance point of view, and it should fit in existing systems. I would say it's quite tough. Let's see how it went. Uh, it, there were three parts to this study. Quite busy slide, but I will take you through it. The first part was actually to formulate the material and uh, to find a, a solution that could biodegrade quickly enough, but still were user friendly, and fulfill the SBCR 120, which is that you can use the digestate as a fertilizer. Uh, the households, they liked it. We, they got positive feedback, but unfortunately, it didn't work in these different systems that we have in Sweden. Another part of, of this study was to evaluate the anaerobic digestion. And unfortunately there, it did not contribute to any of the biogas production either. In the end, they did a life cycle assessment and they came up with the conclusions. And when they studied the, the material used in the bag and how it was processed, and, you, and uh, they found that it's similar to the paper bag, but better to, compared to the plastic bag and not that surprisingly. From an end user perspective, they were very happy with this bag and they really wanted to keep it because in some of the regions they had a paper bag. And so they really argued to keep it after the study was performed. Uh, however, what did we learn from the study overall? Well, I would say that the criteria were quite tough to begin with. We tried to solve many different problems in many different systems in Sweden with one bag. And I would think that we would, should be more aligned. We should cooperate throughout the waste management and also when we are developing these materials so that we can facilitate for new solutions to enter the systems. And perhaps also look into other benefits apart from the biogas production. 
and evaluate them higher, maybe the user friendliness, the actual fact that we can collect more organic waste. Uh, and we can increase the efficiency in the system overall because we spend a lot of time cleaning these vessels, transporting them back and forth to the systems, to the different facilities as well. So by reducing that, we reduce environmental impact as well. However, I think the advantage of this type of study is that it creates more awareness about the system. We can learn more about it. We can suggest improvements and we can talk about new solutions and train the people out there, because we all have different focus areas. So if we look at the value chain here, and then uh, I look at first up as the raw material supplier, it's quite complex to get in there. We don't have a final article, we have the granulate. And so what can we do to improve the development and sort of open up the way for more solutions? Well, we need to know what the value chain looks like, and we need to be active in every step, including the waste management. We need to understand where the challenges are and train the people in each, each step. And so we try to work from both ends. And I think it's a good approach because I learn a lot as well. And then we are working uh, with schools as also to talk about these new solutions and many of them are surprised. So you have a product, it's available. Yeah, it is. You can test it. And we have to collaborate among each other because if we look at the percentage of bioplastic compared <laughs> to conventional plastics, there's room for all of us in that market. And so by helping each other and developing things together, I think we can reach much further and quicker. And so what does it look like within the company of Persorp? How do we look at sustainable development? Well, bioplastics is a part of it, but being a chemical company, we need to do much more. And so the aim is to use less toxic ingredients, not only in the processes as such, but also in the, when we make the product and to decrease the emissions. We try to target and promote sustainable end-of-life options where it makes sense, but we only make a very little piece of polymers in our product portfolio. We try to implement renewable raw materials where it makes sense. Not all renewable raw materials are environmentally friendly. We heard about this earlier. We try to reduce the carbon footprint. We do the LCA homework in, on all our products. We try to implement more energy efficient systems and we use energy, renewable energy sources. And in the end, we want to reduce waste. We want to avoid waste and so we try to make long-lasting, performing products. <coughs> Looking more at the bioplastics again, my favorite topic. So, what can we offer? Well, most of our R&D we spend on making more sustainable solutions. And having the product brand, Kappa, and the, the product under that brand, it makes sense for us to focus on bioplastics because it's compost biodegradable, compostable, and compatible with many other biopolymers. And so with that in mind, our approach is that by making blends with, for example, PLA or starch-based plastics, you can extend the use of these, enhance the properties, and use them in applications where you might not think it would be possible. And we have the certifications for it as well. And if you want the data and the graph, we have that too. Continue. And if that's not only, end of life options might not just be the only interest for many of us working with biopolymers. We want to know what other properties, what other features can you bring into these polymers. And so we have the adhesion, the carrier properties, cool performance with a low TG, where we want flexible solutions that we can put in the refrigerator or freezer. It's compatible with many polymers and you can enhance the properties of them. It's stable and tough and biodegradable. The future then, what are we doing? Well, we ha are making our polycaprolactones and uh, we are introducing a new component into these, the lactide. And it's a nice fit because we are used to working with ring opening polymerization 
And that you can do with the left side, and that we can do with our products. So now we can combine these two, and we can introduce even more features. We can tailor make products, and we can target new areas with these solutions. And the nicest thing of all, we are introducing renewable content in our products. And so there are many things that we can do, and we can create many new interesting products by doing so. Thank you for listening. Thank you. This is a very interesting story. <laughs> Any questions? We have a few minutes' time. Yep. Uh, I believe your graph, polycaprolactone is biodegradable in... Uh, the question I have for you is, PCL has a melting temperature of uh, 80 or... It's 58. 58. 60, yeah. uh, so Sweden will work perfectly <laughs> because it's always cold there. But is there any problems with uh, the PCL melting, especially in the composting and clogging up? Or Because that was always a question mark on polycaprolactone. What I would say is that you usually don't use polycaprolactone uh, by itself. Oh, it's a part of a blend, and the blending ratio will give you the properties in the final article. And if you add around 10 to 30 percent, I don't think that will cause that problem. I mean, we are aware of the challenges in the product, and so we recommend new other solutions to be able to work around them. So uh, with that no know-how and knowledge, I think we can create products suitable in certain applications, and then there will always be applications we have to avoid until we have new solutions, of course. Well, if not so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.